Recently, I built this modern curved desk with storage and it even has a secret compartment. I partnered up with SawStop on this build where you can find the full video and build plans on their website, sawstop.com. I'll link to the post down below if you're interested. The plans for the desk also include a separate rolling file cabinet. So that's what we'll work on today. Let's get started. The plans that are available on SawStop's website include a cut list where it's really easy to follow if you label all your parts as you break down the sheets. I like to use a combination of a track saw and table saw to break down large pieces of plywood. I cut to rough width with the track saw, then cut to final dimensions at the table saw. These pieces are going to be the box that creates the cabinet. The plans don't include this part, but I wanted the front edges of the cabinet to be more durable, so I milled up some hardwood edge banding. Not only will this be more durable than the exposed plywood edges, it will take paint better. You can simply use tape as clamps to hold this edge banding in place while the glue dries, but I wanted to try something different. Since all the parts are the same width, I figured I can place them all together in clamps with a call that's putting pressure on the edge banding. I think it worked out okay. When I do edge banding like this, I leave them extra big in all dimensions, so I don't have to worry about alignment when gluing. So now it all just gets cleaned up. First rough cut the ends off, then flush up the edges. Notice how there's this little overhang. I like to use two hand planes here. One set to take a pretty heavy cut so it removes the bulk of the material. Then a block plane set to take a thin shaving which really refines it. This way, each edge is flushed in literally five or six passes and that's it. Last step is to clean up those ends using a flush trim saw. And this can also be done at the table saw. Time to make the box. Lots of ways you can join these parts together. I'm gonna go with the domino. I considered using pocket holes here since you're never going to see the inside of the cabinet, but the domino is just more fun and less messy. Regardless, the steps are the same. Mark out the hole locations and make sure you label your parts. The sides will get mortises on the edges, which is pretty straightforward and simple to do. The top and bottom panel will get mortises on their faces, which is easier to do with this attachment that keeps the domino stable and prevents it from tipping back. And yes, earlier I said the domino was less messy than pocket holes. One of the best things about it is the dust collection. I love it. Another reason why I decided to use the domino here. I find the glue up is more straightforward than with pocket holes. Just glue in the dominoes, place mating pieces together and clamp it up. With pocket holes, you need to make sure all your parts are well aligned and square before locking them down with screws, which could be frustrating sometimes. And I wasn't worried about aligning or squaring up all these parts because I know the settings on the domino did all of that for me when I was cutting in the mortises. Moving right along, let's build some draws. The plants have approximate measurements for all these parts, but it's really best to use your actual case opening to get the exact sizes you need. The draw sides can be cut to the listed length, but the draw fronts and backs should be the size of the opening minus both draw slides and both draw sides. I cut the half inch plywood to that measurement, then I could trim up all the parts to their listed width that's on the plans. So it's just the length of the fronts and backs that you need to cut to the exact size of your cabinet opening. I like to put my draw bottoms in grooves. I'm using eighth inch plywood here, even though my plans call for quarter inch plywood. I don't know if I made a mistake at the lumber yard or what, regardless, this is what I got. To get the exact size of the groove, I make one pass on a tester piece about halfway through the material. Then I don't move the fence at all and make that same pass on all the draw parts. I like to make sure the blade is cutting at full depth throughout the whole board so I use two push blocks to apply pressure as I'm passing the pieces through. All the parts have a groove. Now I take that tester again and slightly nudge the fence over, make another pass and bring that tester over to the material I'll use for the bottom to see if it's a good fit. Nope, repeat the process, nudge ever so slightly, test again and perfect fit. Now I don't need that tester anymore and I can make that second pass on the rest of the parts to widen the groove to the exact size of the plywood bottom. Now the bottom needs to be cut to size based on the depth of those grooves. 
the width is easy to measure when laying out all the parts because you can see the edges of the groove on the draw sides. Just measure from edge to edge of one groove to the next groove with the draw front and back in place and then rip it to about a 16th shy of that measurement. The length is a bit trickier to measure because the draw side is blocking the grooves. No problem though, just line everything up, making sure all the pieces are flush, then move the draw side up on top of the front and back. Again, making sure those edges are all flush, now you can measure from groove to groove and cut those pieces to length, about a 16th smaller than the measurement taken. For these draws, I went with pocket holes that are drilled on all the front and back pieces. The holes are going to be covered up with the draw face later on, so this is a really quick way to make draws. I sanded the insides of all the parts and began the assembly process. When you make draws using grooves like this, it's really easy to assemble by wrapping the pieces around the draw bottom. I put glue on the edges of the draw fronts, then make sure it's nice and flush with the sides before clamping it in place and locking the piece down with pocket hole screws. I then remove the draw back and repeat the process. And this unit will have two smaller draws, so I did the same on those. The glue is dry on the main cabinet sides. Time to install the back. I decided to inset the back into a rabbit, which is done using an aptly named rabbiting bit. This bit has a bearing on the tip of the bit that follows the inside of the box and the cutters protrude out from the bearing, forming a rabbit on the inside. These bits come with different size bearings to make different width rabbits. They are great. The back is going to be half inch plywood, so I made the rabbit half inch deep in two passes. Then I could cut the back base on the actual opening left over from the rabbit. Some people like to round off the corners on these pieces to match the rounded rabbit left by the router bit, but I like to square up my rabbits. I have this corner chisel, which makes it really easy to get this cleanup going. Line it up in the corner, tap down the corner chisel to get the cut started, then finish it off with a regular chisel. Super easy. Test fit, and the back snaps right into place. So I just add glue inside the rabbit and brads to lock it down. All the boring stuff comes next. Fill in all the holes with wood putty, sand the outsides, round over all the edges, put on two coats of primer, sanding between coats, and painting it black to match the storage compartment of the desk. Also two coats of that. I hate painting. The cut list in the plans includes three quarter inch plywood that will be the draw faces. I had this leftover walnut from my son's bed, so I decided to use that instead. I trimmed up two pieces that will be for the smaller upper draws and took one of those cutoffs to make the face for the larger bottom draw. Everybody installs draw slides differently. Here's what I found that works for me. I place the draw boxes in place with the spacers I'm going to use for installing them at the correct heights. Now that I know where they'll lie in the cabinet, I mark out where the slides will go. This is not an exact science. I like doing it somewhere near the middle on the smaller draws and the lower third on the larger ones. I used to start from the bottom up, but I switched to installing the top first and working my way down. This way I can use one scrap of plywood as my spacer and cut it smaller as I move my way down the cabinet. I ripped the scrap ply to the length marked out for the top slide, place it in the cabinet and the draw slide rests on it. These draws are going to be inset, so I have to offset the slides to the thickness of the walnut faces I'm going to use. This is easy to do with a combo square. These can be confusing because there are a lot of hole options on the slides. I like to first attach them in the slots where you can adjust them front to back. I use a Vix bit to get the hole centered, then lock it down with two screws. After everything's installed and adjusted, I go back and add one more screw into one of the holes that don't adjust. The same spacer is then used on the opposite side. This ensures that the slides are going to be installed at the same height. Moving down the line, I measure the height of the next line I marked out and cut that same piece of plywood to that measurement and repeat the process on those slides. When I first started woodworking, the idea of building draws was super scary. It seemed like the perfection required in getting a perfect fit was something I would never be able to achieve. And then I made some draws and realized 
it's not so bad. If you're out of square or you're out of alignment, there are always adjustments that could be made to make it look like it's square and in line. Guests coming into your house will not be carrying a square to test if your corners are 89.8 or 90 degrees. Well, most guests. Anyway, it's really hard to film these installs inside a cabinet, and it was also really hard working on the floor. I don't know why I was doing that. Once at a more comfortable height that doesn't kill my back, I could attach the rest of the hardware to the draw boxes. The bottom draw is placed a half inch from the bottom. So a scrap of half inch ply is used to lift it up a bit. And a scrap is also used at the front to make sure the hardware is flush against the front. And it's basically the same process as the inside. Except this time, I like to use the slot that has adjustments up and down. So the inside part of the hardware can adjust back and forth, and this part of the hardware can adjust up and down. Using the same spacers I used before when laying out the slides, I installed the next two draws in the same exact way. To get to the holes that are further back, you just have to pull the draw out a bit and make sure the spacer is resting on the draw below it. After they're all installed, there's the obligatory repetitive open shut them to marvel at the job you just did. I like to add a third screw in all the tracks as well. To reach it, I take the draw out and lock it down in the back and repeat this on all of them. The faces can now be cut to size and installed. I measure the exact opening and subtract an eighth inch because I want a 16th reveal on both sides. I used a stop lock clamp to the fence on my table saw with a miter gauge to cut all these faces to the same size and began the installation. On the front, I marked out hole locations and drill a small pilot hole through the piece. I don't want any tear out on the inside of the draw, so I just hold the scrap backer piece in place to create a clean hole. I cut these 16th inch spacers at the table saw to lift the face up off the cabinet and equally space on the sides. The playing card trick is also cool too, if you've ever seen that. The process is simple. Once in a good position, clamp it in place and screw it down using those pilot holes drilled out in the previous step. Since the bottom is so large, I'll probably add a couple more screws, but moving right along to the next draws, the same process is done with the spacers. This time, I really just eyeball it to make sure it's even with the one that's below it and lock it down from the inside with screws. The top draw is the trickiest because there's no space to clamp it from above. No problem, just pull out the draw underneath it as well and use the spacers while it's open and screw it in place. Don't forget to add tape or something so you can open them. See, draws aren't so bad. Just some finishing touches like adding locking casters on the bottom, finishing the draw fronts, and attaching the hardware. I considered making a cutout on these fronts, but I thought these looked sleek and I like how the black matches the outside. There's something really satisfying about putting all the draws in place for the last time in a build. The bottom draw is the file cabinet, and I found these hangers on Amazon. I'll link to them down below. They just sit right on top of the half inch ply sides, and you can hang all your files. Super easy, and it's done. This will live under the desk I built most of the time, but I love that it has wheels, so I have the option to move it around if I need to. This is a super simple build, but I hope I added enough tips in here to make this interesting enough. If you want to build it, check out the link down below to Saw Stop's website where you can find plans for this desk, this cart, and a full video on how I built this super cool curved desk. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you on the next one.